So, well, let's get rolling, uh, kind of, in our preamble. Um, we're, we've been talking about pressures at a point, and uh, if you looked at the stuff for three one, which was Monday's class, ostensibly Monday's class, then you'd have seen uh, that we're now extending that to be able to say how pressures vary with location. I guess we've been doing that by looking at a column of, of air or a column of gas or liquid and making some suggestions about that. Manometry was included in that. And now then we're taking that to the next step to be able to say what pressures are if you apply them on uh, structures. And so those pressures that might be applied, well, it's certainly not wind because that's not statics anymore. But it would be the centerboard of this dinghy uh, and the leverage that you're applying to it. And I guess also when you're moving the sail by pulling reefing on it, uh, you're pushing against a, a pressure, which initially is static, um, balanced on each side. Uh, and then you're pushing it against motion, so Bernoulli comes into play. But for now, we're kind of concentrating on, on fluid statics. So how fluid pressures act on uh, flat surfaces for now. Uh, and then ultimately, we'll talk about curved surfaces and buoyancy, which is really part of the, the same process. So, so I don't know if any of you are sailors, if this is, if this is indeed sailing. I used to, used to be able to rent these boats. Uh, Flying Juniors at Stone Valley. I don't know if they still rent them. I think you can, but maybe there's sunfish that you can rent there now. What else have we got going here? Uh, yeah, this isn't really statics, but we did talk about waves. And I will mute it. Uh, this isn't statics at all, but I think it's kind of a, a neat uh, tidal bore. You know, kind of a solitary wave driving its way up a river uh, just due to tides. Uh, they happen in lots of places. They happen in the Seven Estuary in the UK. This happens to be some river in China, I'm not sure which. Um, coming in, I think, uh, as a result of uh, their lunar tides. They come at a specific time of year. They come as a kind of solitary wave. Some people surf them. Uh, certainly there's, there's a, a tidal bore that comes up uh, the Bay of Fundé each day just due to the tides and people surf it or attempt to surf it. Uh, so not really fluid statics but something kind of interesting I think. And I'll let this one, this last one run. Again I'll put it down to and so this so the reason I talk over these rather than letting you hear the narrative is that uh, because it records from the microphone and also records from the computer, you get this kind of echo uh, that records. So it's just not very, very pleasant. But this also is related to, to fluid pressures. Um, uh, and this was an attempt during the, you know, 19, the Second World War uh, to destroy the uh, power generation capability of Nazi Germany. Uh, and power generation came from that time from hydroelectric power. And so it came down to trying to uh, remove dams that were su supplying power to the, to the war effort. And of course, dams are quite solid structures. It's not like uh, taking out a bridge, which is quite flimsy. They're uh, certainly, if they're buttress dams and gravity dams, then they're very bulky below the, uh, the water surface. So if you want to be able to remove them, then you have to have some an explosion. But typically, in the same way that if you uh, are driving down benches in a, the limestone mines that you say here, you drill a hole down, you put explosive in the bottom, ANFO, ammonium nitrate and fuel oil, and then you put stemming in on top of it to confine it so it just doesn't blow straight out the, uh, the hole that you've made. And so the same idea, I think, for, for this raid was that the, the bombs that were to be introduced to take these dams out were, needed to go to the bottom of the dam. They needed to sink to the bottom of the dam so they had the confinement of the fluid above them and around them so that the energy of the bast would actually go to, um, to, to take out the dam. And so, so the so-called dam busters mission, they, they developed this idea to be able to skip, just like skipping a stone uh, down the, the reservoir, release it from the aircraft, have it settle to nice graphics, I guess, uh, settle to the bottom of the reservoir, 
and then detonate, uh, and then take out the dam. So I think out of four uh, dams that were targeted, maybe three were completely uh, removed. You'll see the, a picture of one of them. And to be able to remove that, I think yeah, that's just the, so the, the, the reality of, of confinement. And so I, I remember uh, pre-9-11, which of course we're coming up to now, um, Hoover Dam, if you've ever been out west, used to, the, the roadway used to drive across the top of that dam. And so after that, now the roadway is a bridge that goes across the gorge, which is completely separate from the dam. And I, I presume that the reason for doing that was related to some kind of uh, security worries at, at the time. So, anyway. so fluid mechanics is all around us, as uh, I'm trying to make the, the point for. Um, so I guess we're at 8 o'clock now. Um, so homework 2 is live, of course, as you know. Um, uh, week five, so we're week three, halfway through. Um, sometime in week four, I'll put out a review video for the midterms, which will be in week five, on the Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. They're in class period, but not necessarily in class. I guess I will come to class uh, just to be here if people want to do them in here. Open books, open notes. We did that last year because of COVID. We'll keep it. Um, I'm not going to make anyone come here and sit with people. I know that's a bit dodgy. Uh, we rely on people's uh, honesty to, to do the things that they should do uh, appropriately and not be in communication with anyone else. Um, and so they will be for half an hour, 8, 7.55 typically we've done till 8.30 on the Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Uh, you should have by now downloaded the stuff uh, from online. Uh, of prior exams. Last year's ex tests will look different from the previous ones just because we went through this transition. And so all of the questions are similar. I'd say that the questions that you'll get because of our format are slightly more straightforward and less onerous than the ones previously, so that's to your advantage. The, the negative is that we don't give credit for um, partial credit for working as we did. So the entry of the exams is just like the entry for your homeworks. It's online. Uh, it's not necessarily multiple choice. Some of them are multiple choice, uh, and some of them are actually putting in uh, numbers, calculations. And the numbers uh, are graded on Canvas plus or minus 10%. So there's a, um, a, a bound to them. And uh, if you're 10% off, that's probably a reasonable engineering calculation. If you're 50% off, then probably not. So we ultimately um, zoned in on 10% last time. If you have a catastrophe and you're working at home, then you just need to write your answers down and email them uh, within a few minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes of the close. So we have contingencies to be able to get things done. And so I'll, I'll go through that in the review session, I think. But that's kind of the, the basic format of where we're going with this. So. Uh, try the, the, um, the practice exam if you haven't already. It's, it's, it, it'll explain everything that I've talked to you here. Um, okay. So, as uh, no one sent me an email, in the 10 or so years I've been uh, teaching this, well, 12 or so, 15, maybe 13 actually, I only received one email once from someone who said, well, isn't Monday a holiday? Shouldn't we not be doing anything? And so my reply at the time was, well, it's an extra credit. If you don't want to do it, that's fine by you. We don't make you do really anything in this class, which uh, you don't need to do, but you should decide whether you want to do that or not. Certainly the material is part of the uh, ensemble that we're, we're skinning together. So I will uh, maybe, just like in all of our classes, recap what we've done. It might be easier to recap it from the, the video that um, you've gone through. And so you remember the video, if you've looked at it, talks about the comet, which was dropping out of the sky, the first British uh, jet liner. They couldn't work out what was going on until they realized that the windows, instead of being curved, were actually square and had stress concentrations in the corner that made them crack, blow out during flight, and uh, that downed the planes. And so a bit macabre, uh, nonetheless. The Aloha flights was um, a Hawaiian Airlines flight that uh, used to do uh, shuttles between the various islands. Uh, I'm not going to run this. Kind of interesting dramatization. And um, in one of the flights, because they take off and land so often, they pressurize, depressurize, uh, fatigue loading. They go through lots of cycles. And the weakening of the fuselage is related to that weakening. 
And ultimately, uh, that and the salt air uh, contributed to, to the top blowing off. Amazingly, the plane landed. I'm sure a scary deal for everybody on board. Uh, certainly, there was at least one fatality, a, a, steward, um, a flight attendant who was sucked out. Um, but I think everyone else was fine. And then the final, we talked about the Malpasse Dam, etc. So, so if you go through the, the YouTube videos, the way to watch them, of course, is to go through at 30 speed. Um, and so I'll use this just to make the point uh, that, so if we can calculate what the fluid pressures are inside a cabin, for instance, um, and we know what the fluid pressures are outside, uh, we can do, just as we did last time, for the step with concrete, a free body diagram to be able to say exactly what uh, the pressure differentials are and what the forces are acting on structures. And so I'd say that one skill in this class is to be able to visualize things so that you conceptualize it and be able to divide it up into a, typically a free body diagram, which is what we're showing here. Um, and so this was an example that we don't need to go through, but I'll, I'll use this material just as our recap to make the points that um, were made in the 3.1 class, because we build on that now. And I don't know, I, I think some of you might have looked at it, some of you might not have looked at it. Actually, I didn't look at Canvas to see who's done the quiz and who has not. But, uh, but we can make the point uh, here in the recap. The basic idea is that if we know what fluid pressure is at a point, uh, we know that fluid pressure varies as a function of the fluid around it, above it, I suppose, not below it. Uh, and so we know that if it's a liquid, um, then it will be linear. If it's a gas, it will be nonlinear. But typically, the pressures are so small. Uh, and as you, we looked at the example for the uh, plain fuselage, we didn't care about the unit weight of the fluid in looking at the pressures, because the pressures are much bigger than the change in pressure due to the very, very small unit weight of the gas. But if you're dealing with the liquid, you have to account for this distribution of pressure. And if we want to calculate what the forces are on a structure, there are three things we'd like to know. We'd like to know what the magnitude of the force FR is. Um, we'd like to know where it acts. And we'd like to be able to then use those two pieces of information the resultant force, FR, where it acts, maybe to be able to do some calculation that relates to the stability of a structure. So here we could look at this force acting on a dam. The weight of the dam holds it here. If we look at um, where it acts relative and the size of W, we could figure out whether it pushes it over like a book on a bookshelf or not, just by looking at the free body diagram. And so the basic idea is that we can take, again, the idea of a differential element, dz. Uh, and we can integrate this along the back just by completing this integral. The force is equal to the uh, product of pressure and the area overall. If we look at a differential element, then it's the pressure times a differential area. And dA is equal to the width times dz, the incremental depth. So if we replace dA with this, then we can do the integration to figure out exactly what that magnitude of the force would be. And it comes out to be equal to this after some manipulation. And there's a very straightforward relationship which we'll use in this class, and that is that the force is equal to the unit weight times the area times the depth of the centroid of the uh, structure. And so if this is the plate that is sitting in the subsurface, then the centroid of this, of course, the centroid of this is the balance point. So if I draw a line top to bottom, top to bottom, and put my finger on that x, if I was skillful, I could probably balance that on my finger, but I can't. That is the centroid. That's the center through which we'd want to calculate the uh, pressure that's acting. And the idea of it is that if you look at this um, inclined plane, which might be this, and if you look at the distribution of pressures across this, if you take the midpoint of this plane, if it's just a, a rectangle, and you draw a line up, then you'd have a point of the pressure distribution which is above that, a point of the pressure distribution which is below that. This triangle is exactly equal to this triangle, and therefore the, the magnitude of the average pressure acting at this point is equal to the depth of the centroid multiplied by the unit weight. So 
The depth of the centroid multiplied by the unit weight, I can't draw on this, but these two end member components would be the average pressure. And multiplying it by the area of the plate gives you the total force because it's the average pressure times the area of the plate. So that's the, the basic idea that we want to um, embrace. So that's, this equation is always correct. This is always the depth of the centroid of the plate. This is always the area of the plate. And this is always the unit weight of the fluid which is around it. Obviously on this plate, the same pressure is acting upwards. Uh, but we, don't, we ignore that for now because that's not very interesting for us. So that's the first part. So we can get the magnitude of the resultant force that is acting. And so remember that figure. We'll use it many, many times. We can get the resultants of forces. I'm not going to look at it in this case. The second thing that we can do, and I'm just going to go through this. You have seen this. I'm going through it quite quickly because you have seen it. The second thing we can do is that we can also take moments around a point. And we can take moments around any point we choose. And so maybe if we choose uh, where the fluid goes through the surface and the pressure is zero or atmospheric, and we could do the same thing as we did before, and we can write this very simple expression. So the total moment that will result is going to be the magnitude of the resultant force, which we've just calculated. We know how to do that, multiplied by the lever arm through which that works. So that's this expression here. And so what we would like to know is we'd like to know where this force acts. So we said we wanted to know the force magnitude, F sub r, the resultant. We know how to do that. We've got the equation. We'd like to know where it acts because that's going to be useful for us looking at the behavior of a structure. So if we write this expression in terms of the forces, the resultant, the point of action relative to the place where we take moments, and the magnitude of the moments, then if we can calculate what this moment is, then we can calculate what YR is. And so we can calculate that quite straightforwardly um, by uh, doing this, just rearranging it in terms of this expression here. Force times the lever arm is going to give us the, mo uh, the incremental moment. The force is just equal to the pressure times the area, which is incremental width of the panel times dy. And so if we go through this expression, blah, 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 we end up with something. I'm not going to go through it here because it's uh, available for you to look at your own leisure. If we go through and fill out the components of the moment and the force, then we end up with a value for what the resultant location. And I think I make it smaller to get everything on one page. I'll let it, I'll let it run. And for this particular plate, where the plate intersects a surface, then the pressure distribution that goes along it is a triangular distribution, as you've seen. And so the location of the resultant, for that case, where it intersects a surface, is always 2 thirds of the depth of the plate. 2 thirds down, 1 third up from the bottom. Always the case. Where the plate is below the surface, that's no longer the case. Because you can imagine, as you get deeper and deeper, the pressure distribution along this is going to be closer. It's going to be the same gradient, but it's going to have a big gap at the top and an even bigger gap at the bottom. So you could imagine that the point of action would migrate from two thirds towards the center of the plate, if you can envisage that. And so this is kind of a standard result. But what we'll do today is we'll take that kind of analysis and we'll try and apply it to generalize it and to be able to use it for any shape, any shape flat plate that we want. So that's our, our job for today. So this, this is just our very long recap. Uh, and I will make the point that it's the centroid of this. Well, we'll use the two equations. The other interesting thing, I think, is um, well, I think this is a party trick for me, uh, my, my little origami trick. So of course, you're getting the benefit of being here in person, because people signing in won't get to see that, this unless I put photo booth on, but I'm not going to do that. It's a bit messy, but you get the idea. So this whole idea is that when you calculate the result in F sub r, you use the depth of the centroid, which is the centroid of this plate, to be able to calculate the average pressure. 
and the force is equal to the unit weight, the area, times the depth of the centroid below the surface. If you look at the magnitude of the force that's applied, or where it acts, it actually acts through the centroid of the pressure distribution. So if I take this triangular pressure distribution, and if I draw a line halfway, halfway, to bisect each of these angles, the point it gives is the middle, and this would be the balance point of this area, area of pressure. And so the balance point of the area of a triangle is two-thirds down from the top and one-third up from the base. And so if you look on the screen behind, that's exactly what that is. So the location of action of that resultant is through the centroid of the pressure distribution. So, so for some of that, some of you that, that might be interesting, for some of you, you might not care. Uh, it's probably not important to understand that um, because we're going to talk about some of these things today. So that's kind of our, our recap from, from last time. So that's kind of included here. I do this. So let me just say say again what 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 we're interested in doing today. I guess I should have this the right way up. This equation here is always true. This is the plate. This is the surface. This is always the depth to the centroid h sub c. Uh, this is the area. The plate has an area. Which, and the unit weight of the fluid is given there. This is always correct. You can always use this. This has to be the vertical distance from the surface to the point. The reason for that is that this is the mean pressure that's acting here. I said before that it would be, so the product of unit weight times height. The product of this is the pressure, right? Unit weight times height is the pressure acting at that location. And all you're doing is multiplying it by the area over this. The pressure distribution, of course, will look something like this. But what we're doing is we are taking this magnitude here. And this is a negative amount that we subtract and this is the positive amount that we add. And so on balance, the pressure at this point is truly the, the average of this because of those two similar triangles in everything. So this is always true, but it has to be the height below the surface to the centroid of this structure, the balance point. Uh, you know, this is just Pythagoras, so you can resolve forces by doing, uh, you, you well know this, right? This is FH don't really need this right now, Fv, and the resultant would be Fr, if you need it. That's all that is. Um, so this is Pythagoras. The force acts through the center of pressure, and we will call this center of pressure Yr. And importantly, Yr is the slope distance. Yes, what is it? Because one is horizontal and one is vertical. Um, so the slope distance. So in this particular case, the slope distance, this is getting to be a very crowded figure, but the slope distance would be, this is the y direction. So we've talked about a vertical plate. It doesn't have to be vertical. It can be slanted. And so this magnitude here, that's the slope distance, I know it's getting busy. Uh, this would be the slope distance YC. We'll, we'll draw it out in, in better form. And so we probably don't need to go through the derivation again, but I will just say exactly what we said before. And that is that what we wanted to do is we can calculate, if we know the resultant, times the lever arm through which it works, that is equal to the moment. That's what we talked about in the previous slide. If we rearrange that to get yr is equal to um, the moment divided by the resultant force, then we have a way of being able to do this. 
That's what we just did in that previous thing, and that's what's written out here in one point. The force is just the integral of the pressures over the depth. The moment is just the integral of the pressures, but multiplied by a lever arm. And the lever arm is just the distance y to that particular little slice. And so these two components, this is fr, and this is mr, they only differ by one value of a y. There's a y in here that doesn't exist in here. So not surprisingly, these integrals end up being slightly different. And so when we take this value of moment and force, we can use that to calculate yr. And without going through all the, the math um, again, we get a standard result which we will use. And so that's the standard result that we'll use in this class. And that is that the location of where that force acts, yr, is given by this term. This is the second moment of area about the surface for the plate intersecting the surface. The area and the slope depth of the centroid of the plate. And we'll go through a couple of examples today to, to reinforce this. In your statics, you should have uh, seen how to be able to use the second uh, parallel axis theorem and split this uh, second moment of area about a surface into a second moment of area about the centroid plus an area times yc. It's not important that we know how to do that here, but it's probably important that we know what these individual components are. This is a standard result that we look up in a table. It's uh, uh, b cubed a over 12 for a square plate. You might, have, you might remember it from your statics. This is the area of the plate. This is the slope distance of the centroid of the plate. So this is the plate. Centroid is the, uh, the centroid of the plate which is really the balance point uh, that it bounces around my finger. And there are two important properties. One is that the resultant force we've said is equal to the unit weight times the area times the depth below the surface, vertical depth. And the other one is that the location of the point of action uh, is equal to uh, this term here. But the point that that is related to this coordinate, and this is the, the slope distance of y in the plane of the thing, plane of the plate, uh, where it intersects the surface. So this is the surface. This is where it intersects the surface. And so this is a standard result. We know the area. We're going to use the same area here. We know both hc and yc, just from the geometry of where our plate and where the water is. And the only remaining thing is for us to figure out what the second moment of area around the centroid is. And just you have those in your book. If you have it, you have those in this chart. If you don't have it, this comes out of a previous edition of the book. And so this is exactly it. So we'll do a, a first one for circle. So this is a standard result. It's equal to pi times the radius of the circle, pi r4 over 4. Always has to be units of length to the power 4. The other standard result we'll use today is for a, a plate, not unlike this. And the term that we'll use is this, which is b a cubed over 12. Again, Units have to be length to the power of 4. B is the width. A is the depth below the surface. So, okay. so that's it. So, you, so to be able to, just to go back to, I guess I don't know if I had it here. I guess it was certainly, well, I won't go back to it. So there's three things that you need to know. Um, you need to know that FR, resultant force, is equal to unit weight, area, times hc. This is the depth of the centroid below the surface. You need to know that yr is equal to, and I can't remember it from now, this term here, i xc plus, what is it, yc a 
YCA, I think, right? Multiplied, and this, the bottom one is not, and this is squared. Standard result. That's probably all you need to know. So those, those two are, are key expressions for us to, to be able to define behaviors. And so if we wanted to draw that out, just to be clear, I'll, I'll check my, um, my drawing skills. So if this is our y-axis, this is our x-axis, um, this is our plate. Then in terms of what we have, this is the centroid, balance point if you like. This term here is what we've called YC. The area of this is A. The vertical depth from this has to be the water level here. And the x-axis has to be parallel to that surface. Y is my finger. Uh, horizontally is um, the x-axis, which is on the water surface. And as a result of this, um, this magnitude here, I don't want to make it coincident with that because it will confuse you. This is HC. This is the, the depth of the centroid below the surface. And I guess the final component uh, is um, the force will act at some point. And so this is where the resultant will act. It acts normal to the plane, so this is a right angle. And importantly, can I get a different color? What should I use? Fuchsia. We're running out of space. But this fuchsia line is YR. So hopefully that's not too confusing. But that's, that's the easiest way to point it out. So all it becomes, if you want to calculate the force, you need to know where the centroid of the plate is and its depth below water, and you can get it. And if you want to know where it acts, it's always going to act perpendicular to the plate uh, for, for planar plates, which is all we're dealing with today. And it will act at a location which is given by y sub r. And it's a function of this term here, which is a standard result. The slope distance of the centroid from the surface and the area of the plane. Okay. So let's go through an example. So this is the, an example to, to kind of re We'll go through two, two examples if we can get through them today. All right, so here's, here's the idea. Um, what we could do is we could take a plate, and we could have that plate sitting below the water table, the water level. It's this circular plate here that I'm doing. I'm doing a section that's vertically through it, and the plate has a pivot point. We know that on one side of the plate, there'll be water acting at some pressure. This would be the distribution of water that we'd have. I guess we could also kind of draw this line here so that we know that if you draw a line through the middle of this plate, which is this point here, so there's, a, there's a, a wire going through this plate that it can rotate around, you could see that the pressure acting on the base is larger than the, one, the pressure, the force that's going to be acting above it. So, in other words, we'd expect that the resultant force, well, we already know it, the resultant force is going to be acting somewhere. It should be below this rotation point because this is a centroid for this plate. If I had a circular saucer, it would balance, to, sorry, wrong finger, it would balance on the um, on my tip of my finger in the middle. And so what we'd like to be able to do is if we know what the the water level is here. We'd like to know what yr is, which we don't know. And we'd like to know what fr is. 
and we know some things about it. I guess we know yc and um, yeah, okay, and we know the radius. So this upper figure is exactly the same as this lower figure, just from a different isometric view. One's side on, one's uh, so in other words, since the force is going to be acting below the pivot, if we want to stop this rotating, we'd have to put a block here uh, to be able to stop it rotating. Um, and so one question would be is we want to be able to do the, the calculation to figure out exactly what, the what force that we'd have to apply. I guess you could ask uh, what force do we have to apply, and I think the question does ask this. What force do we have to apply to the bottom of the plate to be able to keep it closed when there's no water on this right-hand side? So water on the left-hand side, this goes up to the surface, drained on the right-hand side. We want to be able to calculate what those components are. Okay? So it's pretty straightforward. Centroid of the plate. Well, we use the figures that we have here, which are the standard results. We said that the the expressions that we want to be able to use are going to be this. You can write down. We know the area, hopefully you know the area of a plate, pi r squared, and pi r to the 4 over 4 is the standard result. So those are the standard results we'll use. And so here's the calculation. I guess that's where the calculation is already done. So where does the pressure act? What is y sub r? So this question is, uh, where's the centroid? Well, we know the centroid's right in the middle of the plate. You know that without even looking. Where's the center of pressure? Center of pressure acts at y sub r below the surface. Y sub r is equal to this expression. We've just written it out differently. So we've taken, if I don't mean to give you uh, this, we could write this as I x c over y c a plus y squared a over y c a, in which case this becomes this. Right? This just becomes YC. And that's kind of an interesting equation because this means this is the depth. Oops. This is the depth below the centroid, and this is the depth of the centroid. Right? So this is a bit more insightful. To take this expression, just split it out so you have the depth below the centroid plus YC. So in other words, on this figure, what that means, if I make it larger, this would be, if I used the same colors, it's going to get complicated. This would be YC. You know this is YC, right? And this part here is what I've called above delta Y. This term here. So this is this term. So it just maybe, maybe it complicates things for you, or maybe it makes it more obvious. I'm not sure. And so if you put the numbers into this, we know that the value of the second moment is pi r4 over 4. We know yc is the depth of the centroid. So if this is 5 meters, it's a 5 meter uh, radius plate. This is uppercase r. r is equal to 5 meters. So by definition, this would also be 5 meters here, right? 5 meters plus 5 meters gives the centroid. So this depth of the centroid is 10 meters. The area is pi r squared. And yc, we already know, is 10 meters below the bottom. So this, this term here would also be 10 meters. And so if you go through this, uh, you put numbers in for all of these. Uh, you can see this just as well yourself. Uh, it's useful to split it up as being this equation because this is the depth of the centroid. 10 meters below the surface is where the, the balance point of that plate is. And this is the depth below that where the point acts. And so this ends up to be 
10 meters below. It's actually on the hinge point. And this is the depth below that where it acts, and that is 25 over 40. So the depth to the point of action is 10.62 meters. And so that means that if you look at this circle with the hinge through it then and the surface, then what it means is that the depth to the hinge point is 10 meters which is equal to y sub c and the depth where the, the horizontal force acts is 0 0.62 meters below that which is what, what this is okay. we can also do it around the other axis to see exactly where in the plane it would act but because this is symmetric you know it has to act right in the middle so it's not just at this depth, but it's also dead smack in the middle at this point, a, point, a line of symmetry. We've calculated where it acts. Let's calculate the magnitude of the force. The magnitude of the force is this straightforward relationship here. Unit weight of water, 9.81 kilonewtons per meter cubed. The depth of the centroid is whoops, 10 meters below the surface, which is this. And the area is pi r squared. And so if you multiply those out, you get two, two significant behaviors out of it. The resultant force acts 10.62 meters below the surface on the center line, vertical center line of the plate. And the magnitude of that force is given by the resultant, which is this amount here. And so if you take those two magnitudes and you draw them out on here, and you drain all the water out on the right hand side making sure that you put a stop here or initially when it's filled on both sides the same force is acting on each face they'd both be 7700 kilonewtons and they'd both be the resultant to this particular depth if you then drain the left the right hand side then uh, this force would be acting it would be acting below the pivot and so if you didn't have a stop here to stop it rotating it would open and so you could calculate uh, what's acting. Yeah. So you could calculate what force this stop would have to apply just by resolving forces around that point, right? So if you drain this out, what force do you have to apply to keep this closed? And it's just a simple free body diagram. So I guess you take moments. So the moments are zero is equal to, let me write it out, fr times 0 0.62 meters. And uh, acting in the opposite direction, minus f, and this lever arm here has to be 5 meters. The radius of the thing. And so you definitely know what this is, you definitely know this, you definitely know this, you know zero, and so the question is what is fx? And so I won't go through it, but you have it written right here. This is that same expression. Take moments in each direction. Um, and I guess there's one important thing, well, I'll say that in a minute. Take moments in each direction. The only thing you don't know is this. And so you can find out that the force you have to apply is about 1,000 kilonewtons. The force here is 7,700. It's big. And the reason this is much smaller is because it's a much longer lever arm that you have around here. And you'd expect that to be the case. And it's, they're, they're providing the opposite moments to each other. The, the, the one important thing I was going to make is that in this kind of derivation that we talked about, um, to do this, we could take moments around any point we want in our structure. And we'd still come up with the same answer. We chose to take them around this point here. If you're looking at the stability of a structure, you have to resolve with some kind of failure mode in mind. And so the failure mode for this 
is that it would pivot around this central uh, fulcrum. And so to be able to evaluate the stability of this, uh, you have to be able to take moments around whatever the failure mode is. And the failure mode would be that it would rotate around this middle point. And so that's important in the kinds of things that we're doing. Okay? All right. Um, so this is the same figure we've looked at. So hopefully um, it'll make sense uh, in looking at these things. So a, a slightly more involved uh, question. Same, same idea. You have water um, sitting above a gate. The gate happens to be hinged here. Uh, and you can imagine that there are forces being applied by the water. And those forces will be due to the pressures applied on this surface by this distribution here, which would give you some resultant force, which would be F1. So this is this gate drawn out around this. I'm going to remove those forces because I want to draw the other ones. And there will also be the weight of fluid acting here. Which if we integrated it, it would give us F2. And so we have two forces that we're interested in. F1 by this triangular distribution. Actually, I drew it uh, going through zero here. It won't be, right? Because it'll have some pressure already. So if I drew that properly, let me do, draw it properly. If I drew it properly, then the, f the pressures should look something like this. Oops. Right? Because these won't be zero pressures at the top. It'll be some distribution. And so what we'd like to do is we'd, be able, we'd like to be able to calculate what this is. This is a resultant. We'd like to calculate what this is. And we want to calculate where they act, those two things. And where they act would be, in this particular case, y sub r for force 1. And it would be some location. Just from the symmetry of this, we know it's going to be in the middle of this plane, but we, we can calculate that. And so this goes through the calculations for this. Let's calculate each of these. Force 1. The force acting here is going to be equal to the unit weight of fluid times the depth of the centroid below the surface. So it's going to be halfway down this plate and multiplied by the area of the plate. If we look at the question, um, it's three meters into the board, three meters into the page, the width, three meters below the surface to the hinge, and this is the height of four, and this is the height of two. And so we should be able to calculate all these geometric components. Unit weight of water, 9.8 kilonewtons per meter cubed. The depth of the centroid below the surface, the vertical height, Three meters, this is a four meter place. The centroid of this is going to be halfway down it. So this is going to be two meters to this HC. So this five meters actually has to be three meters plus two meters. Three meters to this point and two meters to this point. And the area has to be four meters by three meters into the page. So this term here is the area. This term here is HC1 by meter. Then you do the math and it comes out. We can use exactly the same approach for this plate here. Sitting flat, the centroid is in the middle. Um, so the depth to that centroid from the surface is going to be three meters of water to the hinge plus four meters to the base. So that would be this term here. In other words, this vertical distance to this centroid here, three meters plus four meters. So you've got this, unit weight of water is the same. The area is going to be two meters by three meters into the page, which is exactly what this is. So we can calculate both those forces, F1 and F2, just by doing the math. And you end up with these two numbers here. 
doesn't matter what they are. You're not interested in absolute numbers. So what we want to do is calculate what force we have to apply to keep this gate closed. Clearly, it's pushing in this direction and pushing in this direction. Those are both positive moments about this hinge. And so to counter this positive moment and this positive moment, we have to apply an opposite moment in the p direction. We know the lever arm of this, but we don't know the magnitude. And we don't necessarily know the locations of where these act. If we want to calculate the location of F1, we can use the parallel axis theorem. We use the standard result for the second moment of inertia above, above relative to the centroid. The depth of the centroid, the area, and the depth of the centroid. Yc is the slope distance, remember? When the gate's vertical, that slope distance is the vertical depth. And so this I sub C is equal to 1 12th B A cubed. I'll just go down to show that. A is the vertical depth. B is the width. This is the standard result. And this is the area. You can get those. And so if we use this, um, the width into the page is three meters. The height of this gate is four meters cubed. This is the A cubed. Uh, the depth of the centroid is equal to three meters to the hinge and then two meters to the middle point, which is this. And then the area is four meters tall by three meters into the page, which is this. So this gives the first term. And then the depth of the centroid is 3 meters plus 2 meters, right? which is this. I know it might be like drinking out of a, a fire hydrant, but you can look at these videos if, after the fact. And so this term, yr, is equal to delta y plus the depth of the centroid. Depth of the centroid, of course, is 5 meters. And the difference is delta. So the difference is 0.267 meters. And of course, uh, it's always below the centroid. And as you go deeper and deeper, if the, the water is 100 meters tall, then this centroid would actually mi migrate closer and closer to this centroid. So it always has to be below it, always has to be below it. So if you calculate a YR, which is above the centroid, uh, I don't think that can be right. So you don't, might want to watch that. So we know where it acts. So this would give us the value of YC would be up to here. This would be YC. This would be 3 meters. And this would be 2.267, right? 5.26 minus 3 is 2.267 meters. So this is where it acts. And so when we're taking moments, it's important to know this because we want to take them about, about this point. Um, we know where F2 acts. F2 is a horizontal distribution. And so it'll just act in the middle of this plate. We could go through it and do the calculation, but it's clear that symmetrically, if you take moments around this point, there'd be as much water pushing down on this side as there would be pressure pushing down on this side. And so the only place where it's stabilized is in the middle. So that's it. And so we can take moments. And so if I scam this back out to take moments, then you'll see this expression here. Can you still see that, or is it too small on the board? I know it's a massive board. So if you take moments, they have to equal zero. So we take moments about this point. So F1 multiplied by this lever arm. This lever arm here is what's called L1 on this curve. F2 times this lever arm. This total length is equal to 2 meters. So this length has to be one meter. So this, I guess it's got no label on here. So they're both acting um, counterclockwise, right? Both F1 and L1 are acting counterclockwise. P1 has to act clockwise. P1 has to be equal to P, and the lever arm is equal to four meters. 
And so it seems that we have two unknowns in the equation. No, uh, no, we don't. We have only one unknown in the equation. We know the lever arm, so we can calculate P. And if we rearrange this expression, it comes out that the magnitude of the force that's acting is equal to 436 kilonewtons. And so that, that's it. And so the two expressions that you should remember from today are, are this. They're universally applicable. And uh, so this diagram and the two expressions. We want to know really um, two things, maybe three things. We want to know what the resultant force is acting. It always acts perpendicular to the plane, the flat plane. And always the magnitude is equal to the unit weight of the fluid, the area of the plate, multiplied by the depth below the water level of the centroid, H sub C, which is shown right here. And we want to know the point where it acts. The point where it acts is different from the point of the centroid. That point here is what we've called Y sub R. Y sub R is the slope distance in the plane of the plane, if that's not bad English. And we can always get that slope distance from a standard result depending on the shape of this, whether it's a circle or a square or a quadrant or whatever. And from the depth, the slope distance of the centroid from the surface. Y sub C and H sub C are not the same, right? They're fundamentally different. And the area of the plate. And so those are the two expressions that we'll use in looking at behaviors on planes.